right, welcome back everyone. Hobbit Camp day four. And my name is Wesley. Sharon's here to take your questions. And uh, we are talking about a little bit longer reading today than we've had so far. Uh, the chapters um, six and seven, Out of the Frying Pan into the Fire, and Queer Lodgings. These new themes that we're going to look at today are luck and the wild. Uh, what do the wargs, eagles, and bairn have in common? Is one good question about the wild that I came up with. And then the other for luck, what examples of good and bad luck have we seen so far? And if you look in your program packet, you'll see that that question is expanded on a little bit differently uh, with some suggestions for how to journal on this. If you like to put your ideas down in writing, um, thinking about the ways that what looks like bad luck turns out to have some good effects. Uh, that's one interesting way to think about luck. Uh, like we were talking about the other day too, you can think about how luck relates to the uh, perspective of the person who's in the situation. Um, if they wish for something and it happens, that's good luck. If they wished for something and it doesn't happen or something they didn't wish for does happen, then it looks like bad luck to them. Right, but it sort of depends on their own wishes and their own situation, what they're trying to accomplish. Um, so you can definitely think about how luck connects with the characters uh, and what they're trying to, to do on this adventure. The uh, suggestions for drawing today, if you're more of an artist, you can illustrate scenes involving the wargs and the goblins again, the eagles and Bayorn, all of those. Um, we see some of them take place in the story. Others we sort of just hear about, um, like Beorn's nighttime raid against the goblins and the wargs that Gandalf tells us about. Scary stuff. Or you can draw something more peaceful, like Beorn's house and uh, his bees and all that good stuff. Um, so speaking of that, some activities you might like to do. Uh, play pinecone defense. Uh, play uh, eagle flying with um, paper airplanes. You can work on your beekeeping skills with the little game that's in the program packet. And you can also play a variation on the classic red light, green light game where somebody takes, you guys take turns being Bayorn and the, the pairs of dwarves and um, approaching Bayorn cautiously. Um, that could be fun. All right. To get into our reading today, um, we see Bilbo's reputation uh, picked up quite a bit here. Um, the dwarves are arguing with Gandalf about whether to go back in and, and try to rescue Bilbo. They think he's still lost in the, in the mountains. Um, and Bilbo sneaks past the, the guard, Balin, and appears right in the midst of them. And here's the burglar, said Bilbo, stepping down into the middle of them and slipping off the ring. Bless me how they jumped. Then they shouted with surprise and delight. Gandalf was as astonished as any of them, but probably more pleased than all the others. He called to Balin and told him what he thought of a lookout man who let people walk right into them like that without warning. It is a fact that Bilbo's reputation went up a very great deal with the dwarves after this. If they had still doubted that he was really a first-class burglar, in spite of Gandalf's words, they doubted no longer. Balin was the most puzzled of all, but everyone said it was a very clever bit of work. Indeed, Bilbo was so pleased with their praise that he just chuckled inside and said nothing whatever about the ring. And when they asked him how he did it, he said, oh, just crept along, you know, very carefully and quietly. So uh, we started out talking on the first day about these two sides of Bilbo's character, the Took, the adventurous side, the Baggins, the more, let's say, comfortable, everyday, uh, ordinary side. Um, the Baggins side, as I was trying to argue, uh, seems to be really concerned with reputation, right? And that's part of why he doesn't like to go on adventures at first, is because they uh, will, will make him seem like a dangerous and outlandish character to his neighbors back, um, back where he lives by, by the hill. 
they um, so so the bag inside here is very much concerned with reputation and and what the dwarves think of him, and so he plays this trick. The trick he plays is enabled by his took side, the more adventurous side that uh, helped him escape um, from Gollum, right? Leaping over Gollum, doing something extremely dangerous and adventurous, uh, and then doing his kind of sneaking around to get out uh, of the goblin's cave, the goblin's uh, back door, right? So we see in this instance how the bag inside and the took side are starting to kind of work together. Um, and I wonder what you think of this, uh, the way he tells the story now, right? Tells what happens, but he leaves something out, right? As, as the previous slide suggests, he leaves out about finding the ring. The dwarves looked at him with quite a new respect when he talked about dodging guards, jumping over Gollum and squeezing through as if it was not very difficult or very alarming. What did I tell you, said Gandalf laughing. Mr. Baggins has more about him than you guess. He gave Bilbo a queer look from under his bushy eyebrows as he said this, and the hobbit wondered if he guessed at the part of his tale that he had left out. So someone, I think it was Lucy, you're asking yesterday about Gandalf's bushy eyebrows, so they're very useful for giving queer looks at people uh, out from underneath of them. Um, Gandalf's eyes are emphasized a little bit later too, so we'll see that again. Uh, so why does Bilbo leave out mentioning the ring? That's my first big question here. Kind of a follow-up question you might think about too. Why does Gandalf let him get away with it? You know, so send in your ideas about that. Um, thoughts about what Bilbo's up to here. And if you have thoughts about Gandalf too, do you think Gandalf possibly knows that Bilbo is is lie? I mean, essentially lying, right? I mean, it's it's a it's a small lie, leaving something out of the story he tells, but he doesn't tell the whole truth. Um, if Gandalf does know, why does Gandalf let it fly under the radar for now, so to speak? Right? He lets Bilbo uh, appear to be an even better burglar than he is, um, or at least the secret of how he's such a good burglar now is, is going to stay a secret between Bilbo and Gandalf for now. So as you have thoughts about that, send them on in. Maybe you can connect it with Took and Baggins, Adventures, with Luck, some of these other themes we've been talking about. Any thoughts you have, feel free to send them as we go along. All right. And you might remember, so while you're, while you're sending in thoughts, move along and talk about something else here. You might remember way back at the beginning how uh, Bilbo describes adventures, right? They, inc they include doing wild things like cr climbing trees, right? And so we see some, some tree climbing happen here. What shall we do? What shall we do? He cried, escaping goblins to be caught by wolves, he said. And it became a proverb, though we now say, out of the frying pan into the fire in the same sort of uncomfortable situations. Up the trees quick, cried Gandalf, and they ran to the trees at the edge of the glade, hunting for those that had branches fairly low or slender enough to swarm up. They found them as quick as ever they could, you can guess, and up they went as high as ever they could trust the branches. You would have laughed from a safe distance if you had seen the dwarves sitting up in the trees with their beards dangling down like old gentlemen gone cracked and playing at being boys. Gilly and Keely were at the top of a tall larch like an enormous Christmas tree. Dory, Nori, Ori, Oin, and Gloin were more comfortable in a huge pine with regular branches sticking out at intervals like the spokes of a wheel. Biffer, Buffer, Bomber, and Thorin were in another. Dwalin and Balin had swarmed up a tall slender fir with few branches and were trying to find a place to sit in the greenery of the topmost boughs. Gandalf, who was a good deal taller than the others, had found a tree into which they could not climb a large pine standing at the very edge of the glade. He was quite hidden in its boughs, but you could see his eyes gleaming in the moon as he peeped out. So there's Gandalf's eyes again. Uh, the only thing you can see. Uh, what you can see of the dwarves <laughs> is pretty comical, actually, if you're a safe distance away, right? Like the narrator likes to remind us how safe and sound we are as we read this from time to time. Even though dangerous things happen, happening are happening, we can, we can laugh at them because we're at our own comfortable homes. 
um, the dwarves you can see up in the trees, like Christmas ornaments, you know, with their beards dangling down, like silly old men. Um, so everyone's up in a tree except Bilbo, poor Bilbo, uh, running around like a rabbit. Anyway, uh, we, have a, we have a thought here. Um, yeah, so one reason that Gandalf might let Bilbo get away with his lie about the ring, or leaving out the ring, uh, maybe because Gandalf wanted the dwarves to build trust with Bilbo. Great thought there, Lucy. I thought something similar too. Building trust with Bilbo as far as, wow, he's an amazing burglar, right? We can rely on him. It's it's always great for, for teammates to be able to trust each other um, and know that they're gonna each do their job well. That's certainly true. Uh, the other side of that though, which is, which is a danger that you might think about. If you start building trust based on something that's not entirely true, then what happens when the dwarves find out that Bilbo's hiding from, hide, been hiding something from them? So there's that, there's that side of it. Um, Gandalf is, is, like he said about getting through the mountains, it's touch and go. Gandalf is making some, some choices here and Bilbo too that might have some dangerous side effects later. So we'll see. All right, so for now they're up in the trees, the wolves start howling and coming after them. Bilbo and, uh, is it Nor Nori? Man, I get them all mixed up. Uh, drops down and, and saves them, maybe it's Dory. Oh gosh, anyway. One of the dwarves very bravely rescues Bilbo. At the last minute, they both escape up into the trees and here come the wolves. They're called wargs. This glade in the ring of trees was evidently a meeting place of the wolves. More and more kept coming in. They left guards at the foot of the tree in which Dory and, it was Dory, and Bilbo were, and then went snuffling about till they had smelt out every tree that had anyone in it. These they guarded too, while all the rest, hundreds and hundreds it seemed, went and sat in a great circle in the glade. And in the middle of the circle was a great gray wolf he spoke to them in the dreadful language of the wargs. Gandalf understood it. Bilbo did not, but it sounded terrible to him. And as if all their talk was about cruel and wicked things, as it was. Every now and then, all the wargs in the circle would answer their great chief altogether, and their dreadful clamor almost made the hobbit fall out of his pine tree. Uh, man, that's, that's some powerful language right there. Uh, very, very bad language these wolves have. Uh, very crude, even worse than the trolls. And we heard the trolls were saying some pretty awful things, but true things about one another. Uh, back in chapter two, three? Oh gosh, yeah, chapter two. Uh, and the uh, the way that Bilbo doesn't fully understand what they're saying, but gets the sense of it, um, maybe you've been in a situation like that. You know something really bad is happening. You don't know quite what the specifics are. You, you don't need to know. It's bad. It's rough. Uh, Gandalf does know. And so the narrator tells us a little bit about what Gandalf hears them actually saying. The wolves are complaining because the goblins are late to their meeting, right? So these are very interesting wolves. They're called wargs. They apparently have some kind of connection with the goblins where they help them with something. What are the wargs and goblins up to? What are they planning to do here? And uh, and get a little bit distracted by these, um, what they think, again, are spies, right? Kind of like the trolls um, finding Bilbo by accident uh, as they're up to no good. Do you remember what the wolves and the goblins were planning here in the glade, the, the clearing uh, with the trees uh, growing all, all around it? Um, if you remember, send that in. Uh, now, Gandalf is prepared to kind of kamikaze himself down and, and take out as many of the wolves as possible. He's throwing exploding pine cones at them and catching them on fire. Um, things are looking really bad. And part of it is because of the goblins finally showing up. Bilbo could hear the goblins beginning a horrible song. 15 birds and five fir trees, their feathers were fanned in a fiery breeze, but funny little birds, they had no wings. Oh, what shall we do with the funny little things? Roast them alive or stew them in a pot, fry them, boil them, and eat them hot. 
Then they stopped and shouted out, fly away, little birds, fly away if you can. Come down, little birds, or will you get roasted in your nests? Sing, sing, little birds, why don't you sing? Go away, little boys, shouted Gandalf in answer. It isn't bird nesting time. Also, naughty little boys that play with fire get punished. He said it to make them angry and to show them he was not frightened of them. Though, of course, he was, wizard though he was. But they took no notice and they went on singing. So it's really awful, the goblins here, using the fire that Gandalf has started and putting it around the trees uh, to smoke them out with their own fire, burn down the trees, cut down the trees, and they sing to them all the things they're the awful things they're going to do. They sound a lot like the trolls again, right? And we heard a taste of the goblin song earlier when they caught them in the cave. Um, but Gandalf, although he's afraid, he makes a, a brave show, right? He answers them in the same kind of language they're using. He's not singing back, right? Because they told him to sing, so of course he's not going to sing. Uh, but he does taunt them back, he calls them little boys, he tells them that they'll get punished. And uh, it turns out here that the song about the birds uh, proves all too, um, all too true for the goblins. It's time now for the eagles, right? So saved by the eagles. Eagles are not kindly birds, we're told. Some are cowardly and cruel, but the ancient race of the northern mountains were the greatest of all birds. They were proud and strong and noble hearted. They did not love goblins or fear them. When they took any notice of them at all, which was seldom, for they did not eat such creatures, they swooped on them and drove them shrieking back to their caves and stopped whatever wickedness they were up to, whatever they were doing. The goblins hated the eagles and feared them, but could not reach their lofty seats or drive them from the mountains. So we hear about the eagles seeing what's going on, swooping in for a closer look. Um, there was a howl of anger and surprise from the goblins. Loud cried the Lord of the Eagles, to whom Gandalf had now spoken. Back swept the great birds that were with him, and down they came like huge black shadows. The wolves yammered and gnashed their teeth. The goblins yelled and stamped with rage and flung their heavy spears in the air in vain. Over them swooped the eagles. The dark rush of their beating wings smote them to the floor or drove them far away. Their talons tore at goblin faces. Other birds flew to the treetops and seized the dwarves who were scrambling up now as far as they ever dared to go. So they are saved at the last moment by the intervention, by the eagles swooping in. Uh, and so we met some wolves before and saw that they're not quite like normal wolves. Uh, they speak to each other and they have kind of this, this alliance with the goblins. I don't know if anyone sent it in, but the goblins and the wolves were planning to go and make an attack on some of the people who had been moving into the area recently. They were going to uh, try to drive them out and take them prisoner. Uh, and so that would have been terrible um, for all of the people who were settling in that area. Now, the eagles, we're told, also have been known to prey on farmers and shepherds in the area. They, they steal their sheep. Uh, this is mentioned. Um, it's kind of like the trolls, actually, right? The trolls have been around, going around and stealing things from people on the other side of the Misty Mountains. But eagles are different, too. Right? We can't make them look too, too similar to the wolves. How are the eagles different from the wolves? Well. The wolves and the goblins team up, and the eagles despise, hate the goblins, uh, and the goblins hate the evil eagles and fear them. Maybe, maybe it's maybe I'm mistaking that. Maybe it's better just to say like like the narrator says they did not love goblins or fear them. They just they treat them as as a nuisance, right? They don't even think enough about them to hate them. They just despise them. Um, but the goblins hated the eagles. And they couldn't do anything about them, right? So the eagles fly overhead, swoop down on the goblins at will. The goblins and wolves are helpless before them, are driven away. Uh, even before the, the eagles hit them with their talons, they're, they're, they're flapping their wings and, and the, the wind of it pushes them aside, right? So I think this is an example, like, uh, like we were trying to say before about 
Gollum's riddle about the wind, right? The wind can be a negative thing or it can be a positive thing. And we'll see that even more strongly in, in a little bit here uh, with the dwarves song. Okay, uh, so we've met our second new wild people, the eagles, and they rescue the dwarves thanks to Gandalf. Okay, so we're told here that uh, normally eagles and dwarves don't necessarily get along, but Gandalf had done something for the eagles. He'd uh, healed the Lord of the Eagles at some point when he was when he was sick, uh, hit by a poisoned arrow. Gandalf helped him, and so the eagles owe Gandalf a favor. And so not only do they rescue Bilbo and the dwarves and Gandalf, and drive the, the goblins back, shrieking to their to their hole. Uh, but the eagles are also going to uh, help carry them on their way, right? So up in the eagle's nest, the airy. So ended the adventures of the Misty Mountains. Soon Bilbo's stomach was feeling full and comfortable again. And he felt he could sleep contentedly. Though really, he would have liked a loaf and butter better than bits of meat toasted on sticks. He slept curled up on the hard rock more soundly than ever he had done on his feather bed in his own little hole at home. But all night he dreamed of his own house and wandered in his sleep into all his different rooms, looking for something that he could not find, nor remember what it looked like. So that's really interesting. We get another of Bilbo's dreams here. Remember the last time he was dreaming, he dreamed something that was actually happening. Uh, the goblins appearing through the crack in the back of the cave. And it saved the day because he woke Gandalf up in time to escape, right? So that's one dream. You might also think about that time that they describe, um, he, he thinks that everything that happened at his house was a bad dream, right? And he's all set to go on with his normal Baggins life when Gandalf comes back again at the start of chapter two and gets him on his way, right? So that was the thing that he, thought he dreamed but actually happened now this dream looks like it's just a dream right he's not actually wandering in his sleep it would be really scary if he was right because he's worried about falling off this narrow place up on on the top of the mountains um so hopefully he's actually just sleeping still and just dreaming but uh in this dream he's back home and he's looking for something now you could think about it, maybe he's thinking uh, like he feels a little guilty about not telling the dwarves about the ring, right? So in some sense, that's like an anxiety or something he's worrying about. And so that's why he's dreaming this strange dream, looking for something, but he can't find it, right? Just like he uh, is hiding it from the dwarves. That's one way I was thinking about this dream. Um, Bilbo's dream is like Sam. Uh, yeah, I, I I wonder if you could say a little more about that, because um, I I think I, I I think I can see the similarity here, um, but but maybe you could say a little more. Um, I, I thought it might be about how, again, Bilbo's wishing that he was home. Um, he. Uh, He's been doing this all along, right? Uh, he wishes he was he was back home in his hobbit hole, um, wishing that he could be safe and comfortable. But the interesting thing here is that he's actually more comfortable. He slept he slept more soundly than he ever did back at home, right? So even though he's far away, it's because of all those adventures that he is put into a an even deeper sleep. Um, and maybe there's something now at home that he can't get back to, right? He's been changed by his adventures. And so home is not the same place again. Uh, we'll see, we'll see. Um, yeah, Bilbo's dream is like Sam's dream in one of the later books. Uh, the later books, for those of you who are enjoying The Hobbit, I think Lucy and I would both recommend that you guys read on into the later books and see how the story keeps on growing. Uh, but I'll leave it at that for now. Uh, a fair morning. So on into the next chapter. 
This time he was allowed to climb onto an eagle's back and cling between his wings. The air rushed over him and he shut his eyes. The dwarves were crying farewells and promising to repay the Lord of Eagles if ever they could, as off rose 15 great birds from the mountainside. The sun was still close to the eastern edge of things. The morning was cool and mists were in the valleys and hollows and twined here and there about the peaks and pinnacles of the hills. Bilbo opened an eye to peep and saw that the birds were already high up and the world was far away and the mountains were falling back behind them into the distance. He shut his eyes again and held on tighter. Don't pinch, said his eagle. You need not be frightened like a rabbit, even if you look rather like one. It is a fair morning with a little wind. What is finer than flying? <laughs> so again, two very different perspectives on the same experience here. Um, from the eagle's point of view, it's a great day to fly. Uh, what could be finer? Uh, from Bilbo's point of view, he'd rather be anywhere than up on the back of an eagle flying over this beautiful misty morning. I mean, the description is just lovely. Um, if you've ever been in an airplane or if you've ever been up really high uh, and seen the way that um, in the morning or in the evening, especially the fog and the mist can, can climb up but you're above it and you can see down. Uh, it's one of the most spectacular things. And Bilbo cannot appreciate it in this moment. Maybe later, looking back, he could, but but not right now. Uh, because for him, this is terrifying, right? To be up so high. Uh, he never liked heights. <laughs> All right, so on the one hand, it's scary. On the other hand, it's great because the eagles carry them far, far uh, over these plains way past the mountains and set them on their way. Um, what would have taken them a long time to travel on foot, they can do just like that, flying with the eagles. So they're dropped down on this big rock. Um, they call it the Carrick. And why is it called the Carrick? Asked Bilbo as he went along at the wizard's side. He called it the Carrick because Carrick is his word for it. He calls things like that Carrick's, and this one is the Carrick because it is the only one near his home, and he knows it well. Who calls it? Who knows it? The somebody I spoke of, a very great person. You must all be very polite when I introduce you. I shall introduce you slowly, two by two, I think, and you must be careful not to annoy him, or heaven knows what will happen. He can be appalling when he is angry, though he is kind enough if humored. Still, I warn you, he gets angry easily. The dwarves all gathered around when they heard the wizard talking like this to Bilbo. Is that the person you're taking us to now? They asked. Couldn't you find someone more easy tempered? Hadn't you better explain it all a bit clearer? And so on. Yes, it certainly is. No, I could not. And I was explaining very carefully, answered the wizard crossly. If you must know more, his name is Bjorn. He is very strong and he is a skin changer. So, a little bit before this, we were told that Bilbo exclaimed, uh, escape from goblins only to be caught by wolves, and that became a proverb, right? Um, he created this phrase, and nowadays we use the phrase, out of the frying, frying pan into the fire. When you escape one bad thing and only find yourself in some place even worse. Um, it's a useful sort of phrase, and that's why it sort of... Uh, catches on, right? It becomes part of the language. Um, now, it's interesting here that Gandalf is talking about this thing called the Carrick, and he explains it by saying that that's just what this person's word for it is. Um, he calls things like that Carricks, and this one is the Carrick because it is the only one near his home, right? So instead of a language that's used um, for a common experience, right, that lots of people have, getting away from one bad thing, getting caught by something worse. Uh, this is a kind of the other end of the spectrum. This is a word that's just used by this person. Um, it's because he calls it that, right? It's because it's his place, and and he gets to call it that. Uh, and that's kind of interesting. Maybe you have some things that you have special names for, right? And if you use the special name for the thing someone near you wouldn't know what you're talking about and you'd have to explain. Well, that's just what we call it, right? That might be your, the best explanation you can come up with. Um, now, we especially 
have to uh, come up with with names for new people, right? Um, there isn't really usually an explanation for why somebody's name is what it is. Sometimes it's a family name. Uh, sometimes it does have a meaning or something. But sometimes it's just because your parents like the sound of the name, right? Um, and so Bayorn, Bayorn's name, finally Gandalf gives it to them. Um, I find it interesting that he calls him uh, vaguely just somebody at first, right? I think Gandalf is trying to emphasize, right, just how powerful this person is. Um, but once you put a name on the person, well, then you can start to kind of make sense of that of that thing, right? Um, and so Bayorn is a really interesting name. It actually gives a hint at what his his power is, his skin changing power. Um, so we'll come back to that in a minute here. We get a little more description. So uh, Bilbo doesn't understand. He thinks he means that Bayorn is the sort of person like a taxidermist, right? He uh, takes the skins of animals or something horrible like that. Gandalf says, "Don't, don't even, don't even talk about that around Bayorn." He changes his skin. Sometimes he is a huge black bear. Sometimes he is a great strong black haired man with huge arms and a great beard. I cannot tell you much more, though that ought to be enough. Some say he is a bear descended from the great and ancient bears of the mountains that lived there before the giants came. Others say that he is a man descended from the first men who lived before Smaug or the other dragons came into this part of the world and before the goblins came into the hills out of the north. I cannot say, though I fancy the last is the true tale. He is not the sort of person to ask questions of. At any rate, he is under no enchantment but his own. He lives in an oak wood and has a great wooden house. And as a man, he keeps cattle and horses, which are nearly as marvelous as himself. They work for him and talk to him. He does not eat them. Neither does he hunt or eat wild animals. He keeps hives and hives of great fierce bees and lives most on cream and honey. As a bear, he ranges far and wide. I once saw him sitting all alone on the top of the carrick at night watching the moon sinking towards the misty mountains, and I heard him growl in the tongue of the bears, the day will come when they will perish, and I shall go back. That is why I believe he once came from the mountains himself. So sorry, I missed a quote mark there. So that's Bayorn, or Gandalf telling what he heard Bayorn say. So maybe this is how Gandalf found out the name of the Carrick. I don't know, maybe Baron was having a long talk with, with himself there. <laughs> I'm not sure. But he does hear uh, stories about this person. So remember, when we're introduced to Gandalf, we're told that stories spring up wherever he goes. So here's another example. There's another story here, kind of like at Rivendell with the elves. There are all these other stories and tales that are mentioned, such as Gondolin, the story of the, the fall of Gondolin, um, that their swords are from. And so this is another story that Gandalf knows about, but he's not going to tell more right now. Uh, the story of Beorn and his history and where he comes from and his people who lived in the mountains before all these monsters started to come in. Um, so Beorn, um, his ability to shape shift and look like a, to change into a bear. Uh, this is a story that Tolkien would have been really familiar with because it's one of the ones that he studied and uh, taught as a professor, right? So I mentioned before, uh, Tolkien came up with this story, writing it on the back of some of his students' tests, right? He was bored and he just, he found a blank page, blank page and he started to write and came up with this whole story. Um, now, a lot of his stories that he does tell come out of stuff that he teaches, right? Um, particularly stories from the ancient uh, Norse uh, uh, mythology. Right, so if you guys are into comic books and stuff, you know about Thor and those movies that have been coming out recently. So uh, stuff like that, stories of the Norse gods. Uh, Tolkien was a great reader of those um, and others that are less well known now. Uh, and in these stories, there's this idea, and it's in lots of fairy tales too, right? That people shape shift or have some kind of connection with bears, specifically, um, uh, this idea that you can uh, be both a uh, human and a bear at the same time, either use your magic to, to control this like spirit bear, or you actually change back and forth. Um, kind of like our stories about werewolves, right? Uh, we're pretty familiar with those. So it's kind of like that. Uh, he's a were bear, 
Bayorn. And his name, uh, another thing that Tolkien would know from his studies and from teaching, his name means bear. Uh, Tolkien was a teacher of Old English. Um, and so in, in the Old English that comes from that Germanic, that Northern European roots of the language, that's the word for bear, right? So his name is literally just bear. His name does have a meaning in this case. Um, so we meet Beorn, this dangerous person. Hey, great comment here. Okay, is Beorn kind of like an example of everything wild? He's all the good things of nature in the wild, but he is also the danger that can be in the wild and in nature. Absolutely. Uh, he has those two sides to him, right? The, um, the inexplicable, the part that you can't really explain, that you can't really understand, that's um, beyond you, right? He's great and strong and powerful. Uh, that has a positive side. If he's your friend, uh, he can provide you with lots of good stuff, as we'll see. And it can have a really negative side if he's your enemy or if you just get on the wrong side of him by bad luck, maybe, right? Um, it sounds like even Gandalf was not uh, brave enough to, to introduce himself that time that Gandalf was passing by and overheard Beorn talking, right? Uh, Gandalf was gathering information. He wasn't ready to, to confront or stand up and say, hi, Beorn, right? Uh, no, right, so he's, he's the wild, yeah. The wild that, um, that sometimes looks human, right? That we can understand, that we can communicate with, uh, that we can get honey and all that good stuff. Uh, but on the other hand, the part of the wild that's, that's dangerous, that's destructive. Bayorn uh, certainly has that aspect too. Right, so how do they get on Bayorn's good side here? Well, Gandalf does what he does best. He tells stories, he tells the story. Um, and so he tells more or less the truth also, which is, which is good, okay? So uh, he's telling them about their escape from the goblins. Goblins, said the big man less gruffly. Oh, so you've been having trouble with them, have you? What did you go near them for? We did not mean to. They surprised us at night in a pass which we had to cross, and we were coming out of the lands over west into these countries. It is a long tale. Then you had better come inside and tell me some of it, if it won't take all day, said the man, leading the way through a dark door that opened out of the courtyard into the house. Following him, they found themselves in a wide hall with fireplace in the middle. Though it was summer, there was a wood fire burning and smoke was rising to the blackened rafters in search of the way out through an opening in the roof. They passed through this dim hall, lit only by the fire in the hole above it, and came through another smaller door into a sort of veranda propped on wooden posts made of single tree trunks. It faced south and was still warm and filled with the light of the westering sun which slanted into it and fell golden on the garden full of flowers that came right up to the steps. Yeah, so it's a beautiful mixture here of civilized, right, the house, the fire, um, and wild, and uncivilized, and, and nature, right, the, the garden full of flowers that comes right up to the steps, and the, and the sun on the flowers. How beautiful, right? Just like Bilbo's riddles. <laughs> um, so this, this hall, again, is, is clearly something that Tolkien is fascinated by, the idea of the Mead Hall, where the warriors would gather in those old stories that he loved to, to teach and to study, um, such as Beowulf, right? The, the Mead Hall where they where they gather around the Lord. This is different though, because Beorn is all alone, right? It's so it's sort of sad. Um, but he seems okay, okay with it. But when he does have visitors, Beorn gets really interested in the stories that they tell. And so this is how Gandalf goes about little by little leading Beorn through the story and getting his curiosity and his interest. Um, and that way he can sort of bring the dwarves in little by little uh, without angering uh, the great bear man, um, getting on his, his, getting him annoyed and, and, and bothered, right? He treated Bilbo very differently, didn't he, Gandalf? Uh, he, uh, he didn't explain and he didn't, uh, he wasn't present. Um, as the dwarves kept coming in more and more. And that just made Bilbo more and more concerned, right? Until it was too late. <laughs> um, we see this little pattern actually over and over in the story where the, 
The dwarves do the same thing with the trolls. You remember? Uh, they come one by one, actually, with the trolls and get caught. And uh, and they, they, from the goblins' point of view, the dwarves were uh, trespassing on their front porch, too. Remember, they call it the front porch. What were you doing there, right? Um, yeah, so it's interesting. There's some something interesting going on here with uh, playing with the numbers of these dwarves and how they, they come by ones and twos. Aha, yeah, yeah, the, the honey. Lucy brings up, uh, Beorn being a bear would explain his love of honey. Yes, definitely. Um, and uh, yeah, bears and bees. This is this is built into the the name Beowulf. If you if you've heard of that, it's a story uh, that Tolkien loved. And so if you haven't read it, I highly recommend it. Story of Beowulf. It's great. Um, Beowulf's name seems to be made of two pieces. Uh, this is one theory about it. The piece that means um, uh, bee, right? And the per the piece that means wolf, literally bee wolf, might be a bear, right? A bear is a wolf of the bees. Uh, going after the honey and getting it and not being concerned with the bees stinging because it's got the thick uh, thick coat, right? Um, honey is another great example of how nature can be wild and dangerous, right? The bees might sting you, but it can also be so uh, uh, nourishing, right? Honey is one of the best things to eat, so uh, Beorn has, has plenty of that, right? So he finds their story brilliant, he loves it, he uh, invites them in and uh, serves them. So they feast. Inside the hall, it was now quite dark. Baron clapped his hands and then trotted four beautiful white ponies and several large long-bodied gray dogs. Baron said something to them in a queer language like animal noises turned into talk. They went out again and soon came back carrying torches in their mouths, which they lit at the fire and stuck in low brackets on the pillars of the hall about the central hearth. The dogs could stand on their hind legs when they wished and carry things with their forepaw, with their forefeet. Quickly, they got out boards and trestles from the side walls and set them up near the fire. There they had supper or dinner, such as had they had not had since they left the last homely house in the west and said goodbye to Elrond. The light of the torches and the fire flickered about them, and on the table were two tall red beeswax candles. All the time they ate, Beorn, in his deep rolling voice, told tales of wild lands on this side of the mountains, and especially of the dark and dangerous wood that lay outstretched far to the north and south, a day's ride before them, barring their way to the east, the terrible forest of Mirkwood. So, again, um, comparing here Beorn's house to the last homely house in the west. In some ways, they're similar, right? Because they get a great feast, they get plenty to eat. Uh, they have great hospitality. Um, they have a powerful person in charge. Uh, Beorn is of a great stature, of great uh, uh, strength, um, very much like Elrond. Um, they also uh, tell lots of stories, right? And we don't hear much about the stories. We just know that there are lots of stories. And that makes them really interesting. I don't know. That makes me curious. Uh, what stories is he telling, right? Um, we're going to find out a little bit more about Mirkwood soon. And that seems to be very interesting to the dwarves because they have to pass through Mirkwood. So that's pretty relevant to them. Um, we also see here a, another way that Beorn is connected to the wild. He, like the wolves, has his own language that he uses with animals. Um, we're not told, I don't think, if Gandalf understands this language. But anyway, it seems pretty clear what he's telling them is, Hey, bring out the uh, the boards for our guests. Bring out their chairs. Bring out the the torches. Right. Um, so Beorn speaks to animals in their own language. Uh, whether Gandalf understands everything he's saying or not, he doesn't let on. Maybe he's again uh, not telling everything he knows. Uh, Gandalf does mention uh, his cousin Radagast, though. Uh, if you guys have seen the uh, the Hobbit movies that came out recently. They make Radagast a much bigger character. This is pretty much the only mention of, of him in, in the story. But um, but anyway, we're told that Beorn does get along with Radagast. They, they, they get along okay, right? He's, he's, good. he's good as far as wizards go. So um, anyway, uh, another example also, I love the detail of the two 
tall red beeswax candles. So another way that taking something from nature and making it uh, work for you, right? It, it's, it's a source of light, um, which is a, a very human thing, right? We use fire. Um, but these animals that hang out with Bayorn, he has apparently uh, taught them or they're somehow special. They can do all these human-like things. They can walk on their hind legs. They can carry torches around. They're not afraid of fire. Uh, they can speak in this animal language. So pretty remarkable. All right, so a delicious feast. And of course, uh, the dwarves have to have to sing another one of their songs. So this is their wind song. Um, as I'm reading this one out, uh, what do you notice going on in this song? Uh, what do the dwarves seem to be talking about um, by, si by singing this song about the wind? Uh, does it remind you of anything? Does it uh, point us towards anything that we should watch for um, in, in the rest of the story? Um, yeah, just what, what do you notice here in this in the song? Anything at all? The wind was on the withered heath, but in the forest stirred no leaf. Their shadows lay by night and day, and dark things silent crept beneath. The wind came down from mountains cold, and like a tide it roared and rolled. The branches groaned, the forest moaned, and leaves were laid upon the mold. The wind went on from west to east, all movement in the forest ceased. But shrill and harsh across the marsh, its whistling voices were released. The grasses hissed, their tassels bent, the reeds were rattling. On it went, over shaken pool, under heaven's cool, where racing clouds were torn and rent. It passed the lonely mountain bare and swept above the dragon's lair. There, black and dark, lay boulders stark and flying smoke was in the air. It left the world and took its flight over the wide seas of the night. The moon set sail upon the gale and stars were fanned to leaping light. So, the dwarves tell a story here about the movement of the wind. And each of these stanzas, each of these groups of lines, seems to give us a different scene on the wind's uh, journey that it's taking. Um, now, describing the wind going on a journey might make you connect this to the characters, right? The dwarves and Bilbo and Gandalf going on their journey. Um, they're going from west where they met Bilbo and they were further west before that, it sounds like, to east. And we even get the mention there uh, in stanza five over here of the Lonely Mountain. So that's their destination as far as we know. Uh, that's where they're headed and they mention the dragon's lair, right? They have to deal with that dragon. We still don't know quite what they're going to do about that. Apparently, the wind is not too concerned about it, though, right? As the wind goes along, um, things become uh, stirred, right? Stirred up. It, it, it's loud when it comes down the mountains, right? It um, quiets the forest but it releases whistling voices in the marsh. It makes the grass hiss. It moves the clouds, tears them. It passes the lonely mountain and swept above the dragons. So it can blow right over this, this huge obstacle of the dragon's lair. And the wind doesn't stop there. This is the wild thing about this, this song. Uh, it left the world and took its flight over the wide seas of the night. Um, the wind goes beyond the mountain and leaves the world entirely, it sounds like. This is a, suddenly a particularly supernatural sort of wind in that last stanza. Um, so it suggests that the dwarves are, uh, are thinking even beyond the Lonely Mountain. They're thinking of their journey here as being something that is kind of uh, cosmic, right? Uh, 
it's connected with the stars and the moon. And that might make you think about the moon runes, right? The, uh, the way that the map can only be read by a certain light of the moon, the way that the key will only fit if it happens when the sun and moon are both in the sky, right? So the stars, the moon, this, these celestial objects are, are involved in the dwarves' journey. Uh, and that's, that's pretty remarkable. Um, to, to put it another way, right? They are going to rely on some pretty amazing luck to have a successful uh, end to their adventure here. Um, because they, again, they don't actually have the skill to know when that day is that the sun and moon are both hanging in the sky on the uh, last, in the last month of, of autumn. Right, have I got that right? Okay, I hope I do. Um, I'm forgetting now too. But okay, did you guys uh, see something else in the story? Great. So Lucy points out the geography here, the wood, the marshes are between them and the mountain. Yes, exactly. So they have, have already done some of the journey, right? That area where they met the trolls, that might be the withered heath, the mountains where they met the goblins and then the, the wolves and eagles. They've already got across the mountains, okay. But now they've got to deal with the forest. Yeah, the wood, the marshes. Mm -hmm. That's beyond the, the, the forest. and. Finally, the Lonely Mountain. All right, all right. Um, another comment here, great question. Uh, do the dwarves almost wish they could be like the wind so they could travel more quickly and more easily? Nothing stops the wind. Yeah, yeah, it seems like that's a part of why they compare uh, the uh or why they talk about how the wind can go from uh through each of these settings without being stopped right um it has effects on other things but nothing seems to stop it totally totally uh they seem to be um traveling yeah along here uh as quick as they can um they're also uh, in a bit of a bind here because they're going to have this difficult uh, uh, obstacle of the of the forest to contend with. So this is kind of bringing us back down to reality a little bit here um, when we hear about what's what's going to be here in the forest. Uh, I won't read all of this this long passage to you guys, um, but Bayorn gets into really specific detail about um, what he's giving them, right? And this is great, right? Uh, kind of the opposite of the wind, which just goes, right? They're gonna have to bring along honey, cakes, water, right? Um, and I'll pick up here in the middle. But your way through Mirkwood is dark, dangerous and difficult, he said. Water is not easy to find there, nor food. The time is not yet come for nuts, though it may be passed and gone indeed before you get to the other side. The nuts are about all that grows there fit for food, and there the wild things are dark, queer, and savage. I will provide you with skins for carrying water, and I will give you some bows and arrows, but I doubt very much whether anything you find in Mirkwood will be wholesome to eat or to drink. There is one stream there I know, black and strong, which crosses the path, that you should neither drink of nor bathe in, for I have heard that it carries enchantment and great drowsiness and forgetfulness. And in the dim shadows of that place, I don't think you will shoot anything wholesome or unwholesome without straying from the path that you must not do for any reason. So warnings about Mirkwood, right? Watch out for all these creatures that grow there. They're, they're savage. Um, watch out because there's very little to eat there. And if you do stay in there long enough to be able to gather some food, you 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 might run out of water, so that's bad, right? So you're gonna have to hurry and watch out for the stream there. If you do see any water, don't touch it, right? The dwarves, uh, they enjoyed a little bath before they got to Bayorn's house uh, by the Carrick, but now no no bathing in this stream. No, don't drink from it, right? 
uh, it's, it carries a great drowsiness and forgetfulness. Okay, so he warns them, stay on the path. Okay, Gandalf too said farewell. Bilbo sat on the ground feeling very unhappy and wishing he was beside the wizard on his tall horse. He had just gone inside the forest after breakfast, a very poor one, and it seemed dark in there in the morning as at night, and very secret, sort of watching and waiting feeling, he said to himself. Goodbye, said Gandalf to Thorn. And goodbye to you all, goodbye. Straight through the forest is your way now. Don't stray off the track. If you do, it is a thousand to one. You'll never find it again and never get out of Mirkwood. And then I don't suppose I or anyone else will ever see you again. Do we really have to go through, groaned the hobbit? Yes, you do, said the wizard. If you want to get to the other side, you must either go through or give up on your quest. And I'm not going to allow you to go to back out now, Mr. Baggins. I am ashamed of you for thinking of it. You've got to look after all these dwarves for me, he laughed. All right, so it's sort of a joke, but it turns out it's sort of serious that Gandalf is saying Bilbo's kind of in charge now, right? We saw Bilbo took some initiative back with the trolls. We saw that he has gained in some reputation and respect after he uh, showed himself an amazing burglar sneaking past Balin. Um, and so uh, no one's happy to see Gandalf go, but Away he goes. He has other business to attend to, right? So yet another, another tale that's aside from this part of the story. Um, but the main thing that uh, Bilbo has got so far seems to be luck, right? Um, they point out that when they uh, when they were caught by the wolves, the wolves were about to go and attack uh, the settlers there, right? So. What was bad luck at first, getting caught by the goblins, turns out to be good luck because they kill the goblin king and they uh, disrupt, along with the eagles coming in, which is another piece of pretty good luck, they disrupt that attack. Um, the eagles fly them along their way, right? So they move faster, almost as fast as the wind. Um, good luck there. Uh, Bayorn helps them out and even goes back in and causes a ruckus fighting more goblins, right? So they, again, they cross through now the forest uh, on a different path than they were expecting. And we'll have to wait and see whether that turns out to be a good thing or not. Um, so far, luck has been with them. Right, but Gandalf warns them, don't leave the path, right? It's very unlikely that they will ever find it again. Okay, so we'll see. We'll see how they how that goes. Um, yep, for tomorrow, chapters eight and nine. So again, uh, if you guys are keeping up with this reading, you're doing great. Uh, it's been, I know it's uh, getting getting very uh, uh, very uh, dense, a lot going on, um, but keep sending in your questions and your ideas about it. Uh, I know those help me out a lot uh, as I'm trying to, to figure out what, what's the most important things that we can talk about in our hour. Uh, for me, these have been really, really uh, interesting discussions. Um, yeah, yeah, Lucy points out all the dwarves will be looking up to him. Yeah, absolutely. They um, they seem to uh, to trust, as Gandalf says, that uh, Bilbo will make a, a good a good leader on this part of the journey. Um, so, of course, tomorrow we'll look more at Mirkwood and all the beings, uh, various kinds who live there. What happens when you leave the path? <laughs> Uh, and how Bilbo continues to grow uh, in this part of the story. Uh, <laughs> uh, a funny uh, but true remark, yep. Nowadays, we can't drink the water we find in nature anymore because of diseases. Yes, pollution, um, kind of the opposite of enchantment. Yeah, yeah, uh, but a similar problem. Uh, again, check in when you get a chance. Um, find us on YouTube and, and send us emails. Uh, we are very, very happy to um, to respond to any ideas that you guys send in. So until tomorrow, happy reading, and I will talk to you again then. For now, goodbye.